Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today I am trying a new experiment. This is going to be an open-ended conversation with myself. I'll be interviewing Dr. Jeffrey Mishlove. And the reason I'm doing this is because I think I'm a pretty good interviewer, and I might be able to ask questions of this most interesting guest that other interviewers won't get at. So, welcome, Jeffrey. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited about this opportunity. Thank you for inviting me. This is an open-ended conversation. I don't have any agenda. I don't think you have any agenda either. So, let me begin by asking you, what inspired this experiment? Thanks for asking that question. And I have to say, it happened quite spontaneously. Just today, as a matter of fact, I began reviewing current trends on YouTube. And I realized I've been doing the New Thinking Aloud channel for five years. And maybe it's time to try something new because I see that on YouTube, YouTube itself, there are many forms of experimentation going on. In fact, I was quite inspired to, to look at what the VTubers are doing, people who are using avatars, virtual. And I even had this idea. I would design a realistic avatar of the space intelligences that worked with Ted Owens, giant praying mantis beings. And I contacted an artist who did 3D modeling to see could he create that kind of an avatar for me, a 3D model of a giant praying mantis that would talk when I talked and move its eyes and head and who knows, maybe even limb movements and Then I realized, wait a second, that's going to be awful, complicated, expensive. And the artist I spoke to said, yeah, I can build the model, but then you're going to need two or three more layers of professional help. And uh, as exciting as it might be, it dawned on me that really the key is in here. It's in the heart. I can add all sorts of technology. And as you know, right now, I'm adding a new technology. I'm using two cameras on myself at the same time. That's a bit of an experiment, isn't it? Yeah, I I think it is. And I want to commend you for your creativity here. But, you know, I can take it further. And the idea of interviewing myself is a chance to go deeper, to get at things that I don't even often reveal to myself. One of the issues that your viewers are probably very interested in would be your thinking about your friend Jason Reza Giorgiani. You've expressed in the past how much you love that man, and it seems that there's been a real falling out. Do you feel like that's something you'd like to talk about? Thanks for asking, and it is something I would like to talk about. And I'm concerned for Jason. So, yes, it is a topic I'd like to get into, but let's save that for a future time. I wonder, are there other subjects that you would think are worthy of discussion right now? Of course, there are the deeper issues underlying the 10-year, 11-year research program that I engaged in with Ted Owens, the PK man, and his contacts, the space intelligences, my very desire initially to create an avatar for myself that would be a giant praying mantis. It was a an effort for me to get inside the mind of the space intelligences that worked with Ted Owens or that he believed he was working with and he was very descriptive about them. And let's assume for the moment that they might well be real. Uh, Let's work, use that as a working hypothesis. If that's the case, then it's fair to assume since I was intimately involved with Ted Owens, uh, at the level of the work they were doing with him for a decade, they're well aware of me. And I should be able to tune in to access their mind to learn from them something. And 
I don't consider myself a great psychic or a great remote viewer, nor am I a great actor either. But because I've been doing this work so intensely, I understand that I have within my consciousness, if I can pull it out, access to information vastly beyond anything that's yet been revealed on the New Thinking Aloud channel. Of course, it's highly intuitive information. It's information that would be justifiably suspect for any of my viewers, but that's an area that I'd like to delve into and perhaps if if we continue this interview series beyond this initial experiment because right now to be honest I know we're just experimenting with the format let me ask you this then what other topics do you think might be of interest since I'm talking about accessing the intelligences that worked with Ted Owens, the space intelligences. And, and let me just say another word about them because he described them like giant praying mantises. And I know there's a literature in the UFO community about giant praying mantis beings. There's even artwork describing them and it, it, probably a much vaster literature than I've ever looked into. But Owens said about them that they're really energy beings. He said, yeah, they do take the form of a praying mantis, but they're pure energy. And it dawned on me that in spirit, we're all pure energy. If I leave my body, <laughs> and have out-of-body travel or a near-death experience or even remote viewing, I'm a pure energy being too. I'm not limited to the shape and form of my terrestrial body. Anyhow, so that's one issue. Another issue, though, is contact with the deceased. I've had some wonderful interviews lately, or perhaps I should say you've had some wonderful interviews lately. Yes, I have. With Stephanie Stevens, for example, who goes into Carl Jung's ostensible communications with the dead. Now, the interesting thing for me is that you, yes, me, you have interviewed many, many great people who are now deceased. Some of them were your dear friends like Jean Millay and Elizabeth Rauscher. Other people are, are famous psychologist Rollo May. You know, they're 50 or 60 such people that you've interviewed, including a few now from the new Thinking Aloud series, but mostly from the original Thinking Aloud series. In effect, what I have, what you have, what we have is a committee, a population, a cohort of people with whom we have had intimate conversations who are now deceased. People like my mentor, Arthur M. Young, and, and my dear friend, Dean Brown. I wonder if there's some way to use this format to gain more access on that level, to begin to explore in more subtlety and more nuance the realms of the Bardo planes and whatever wisdom can be gained from probing the minds of those who are no longer with us. You know, and in particular, one worth mentioning is Elizabeth Targ, who apparently reached out to me. I've described it in my interview with Russell, the dream that I had in which Elizabeth spoke to me. I was with her in a dream. We were conversing. I was telling her in the dream, how nice to see you, Elizabeth. And I'm so impressed with the various communications that I have heard about through Jane Ketra and Mark Cummings. Uh, I said, especially the physical manifestations. And at that moment, out of my dream, I was awakened because the phone rang and I had a conventional telephone next to my bed back then. And when I picked it up, all there was on the other end of the line was white noise. It really suggests a possibility of greater communication. That would be a fascinating exploration. I would love to be able to interview you and, and see what other things you could tell me about that. I, I wonder if there are other areas that uh, would interest you. Hmm. Well, those 
three that I believe we have now identified are very interesting areas. And I'm sure there are more ancillary, auxiliary areas because you know the way my mind works. I touch upon many, many things. Everything leads to something else. So I think for now, uh, I can't come up with a, with any others. But let me ask you, how do you feel about interviewing me? Fascinating. It is most fascinating. It seems as if I find within myself two different personalities, the interviewer and the interviewee. It's really quite astounding. And it seems to me that there's some magic taking place here. And magic is a special thing. Magic indeed is a special thing. And magic would be a great fourth topic, something to probe magically. What is magic? It's, I know it's something I was very interested in, particularly from the day that I first arrived in Berkeley and discovered the Shambhala bookstore on Telegraph Avenue with many, many books about magic. I began studying magic as soon as I arrived in Berkeley in 1969. So, yes, magic would be a wonderful topic. But what about some of your own personal issues? What about your family? What about issues of uh, your intimate life? Would you be willing to share those with your YouTube viewers? You know, I was starting to do that in the In Presence monologue series. And as I recall, I, I was opening up in a way in which I felt connected to the viewers. I would refer to them, I think, by the phrase, you guys, you guys who are watching. And I got a comment from one of my viewers who said, you know, you're so serious. Do you really want to become just another YouTube personality? And I sort of backed off from it at that point. I began to feel like I'm a scholar. I am a serious interviewer. I approach these topics scientifically. I don't want to sully my reputation by uh, becoming just a, a personality uh, like the makeup artists and others who are on YouTube. But I have to say this, I noticed that some of these people have millions of followers on YouTube. So, maybe it's appropriate. I can open up more from my heart. Isn't that what it should be about? Well, sure. But what about revealing your vulnerabilities, your insecurities? You know, I think a lot of people watch YouTube because there are some YouTubers, and I know you watched one of them just this afternoon, who has a big following, I think six million followers, and he talks about his insecurities. Of course, He's very creative with the video camera. He's doing things far more sophisticated than uh, we're doing together right now. But aren't you afraid of exposing yourself? Sure, I am. I, I don't want to embarrass myself. Far from it. I, I want to maintain a, a sense of dignity. And uh, uh, that is a, a kind of a a sore spot for me. How, how much can I really open up? I can tell you this right now. There's some things I probably will never get into. They're too embarrassing or too, too close to my heart, perhaps, to share on, on YouTube. But I think I could take some steps in that direction if it was done in a, a, a loving, lighthearted way. Well, you know, you can count on me to be a loving, lighthearted interviewer. That's, Really, that's my trademark, isn't it? Wouldn't you say? Well, well, sure it is, as a, as a matter of fact. So, yeah, I think it would be appropriate. I mean, there are lots of things I can say right now. For example, even though I'm a parapsychologist, I don't consider myself a, a great psychic, maybe not even a good psychic. I've had plenty of failures in my parapsychology experiments and in, in my effort to uh, enhance my own psychic functioning. I think, you know, one, one of the things I could probably talk about with some validity are the 
many, many awkward moments I've had trying to open up to experience psychic liberation to become a role model for other people who are doing that. Okay. But you know, I think there are other vulnerabilities as well, to be honest. For example, what about the viewers? What do you know about your viewers? Well, one of the things I'm aware of is that the viewers themselves have a wide range of opinions and some vulnerabilities. I remember recently a viewer, uh, I don't want to mention her name, but it was a, a lady, uh, posted a comment and I read all the comments and, and she said that she's starving and she doesn't know where she's going to get her next meal. And I, I was very concerned. And in fact, shortly thereafter, I had a dream and in my dream, her name kept repeating over and over and over again in my mind. And you know, when I woke up, I tried to search for her messages. And for some reason that day, I didn't find them. In fact, what I did find for some reason, uh, when I tried to do a Google search, she, because I couldn't find any of her comments, uh, maybe I misspelled her name. I'm not sure. Uh, I ended up on a pornographic website, really hardcore porn, <laughs> which was titillating. And I thought maybe there was some meaning, but in retrospect, I misspelled her name. And then when I went back to finally discover her comments in the comments section, I see that she wrote the very last comment I heard from her. It was, it's over. There have been no further comments since then. And I've often wondered what happened to this person. Did she commit suicide? What I mean to say is I know people out there are suffering. Here I am talking about higher consciousness and parapsychology. And there are people who don't know where their next meal is coming from. People who are viewers of this program. That is truly, that's an issue for me. Yeah, but what can you do? when you're confronted with that sort of an issue. You know, one of the things I do, for what it's worth, is I try to send healing. I, it could be my imagination entirely. <laughs> In fact, I think there are moments when it definitely is my imagination. I often awaken in the middle of the night, and if I'm wide awake enough, I will enter a meditative state, and I'll simply say to myself, heal heal, heal. And I visualize in different ways each time sending of healing energy, sometimes to specific people, sometimes to my own household, sometimes to my relatives and friends, sometimes to people, particular people I know are suffering, sometimes to the city here in Albuquerque where I live or to the state of New Mexico or to the United States, which is going through enormous upheavals at the moment, sometimes to the world. And sometimes I reach out beyond the world itself into the galaxy, into the universe, and then beyond the physical universe into the psychosphere, the realms of heaven and hell. I try to send healing all the way. And there are moments when I feel so connected. It feels so real. I have no doubt in my mind. I could be deluded, of course, but in my mind, this is happening. This is really sending healing. I can heal the entire universe. And ironically, I can be healed by the entire universe. It sounds beautiful. Of course, you understand it could be, in spite of your best intentions, a fantasy. It certainly could be. I have no guarantee <laughs> for sure, but it feels good to me and it's something I can do. And based on my background knowledge of parapsychology, I have reason to think that it is working, that it is helping, that maybe it's a tiny little thing. The universe itself is so big in comparison to me or any single human being. But nevertheless, it's like homeopathic in a sense, the tiniest little homeopathic remedy that doesn't even have a single molecule of any real remedy in it can be incredibly healing. How does that work? You see, my background in parapsychology gives me some confidence to think that 
one can move from the realm of fantasy into the realm of what Henri Corbin called the imaginal. And that can be very real. I'm inclined to think it might be very real. Well, I'm willing to bet that you use this with regard to the current political situation, and I'm willing to bet you use it with regard to people you have conflicts with, like, for example, your friend Jason. Well, of course I do. And also, let me remind you, I did create a, an in-presence video, a monologue at one time, if I remember rightly, uh, based on one of Ted Owen's exercises, your karmic bank account, in which he pointed out that one of the best ways to add to your good karma is to do good things and send positive energy for people who you regard as your enemies or who regard you as an enemy. Love your enemies. I try to live by that, actually. <laughs> that raises an interesting question, love your enemies, because it sounds very Christian. It's sort of the opposite of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And I know that in, in spite of the fact that you were raised Jewish and you have more resonance with the Jewish religion than any other religion, that you have a deep appreciation for what people sometimes refer to as the cosmic Christ, not necessarily Jesus Christ or Jesus the Christ. <laughs> After all, Christ is not his last name. But the notion that love is the alpha and omega of the universe, the notion that the universe was born out of love and will end in the fusion of everything into a single singularity, an infinitesimally small point. Everything will be unified at the end of time as it was before time began. What a beautiful thought, and I endorse it. I do. And I'd like to say more, as a matter of fact, about my deeper religious and spiritual feelings. I started to they begin to explore what I call the theology for the third millennium and with interviews with Peter Todd, who is now deceased, a beautiful man. He was a, um, as I recall, a gold medalist in the first gay Olympics as, as, as a bodybuilder. But Peter became a Jungian therapist and uh, a very sensitive soul who went to great lengths to rent a professional video studio where he lives in Australia so that I could do some high quality interviews with him. And it, it is my intention to follow up on some of the thoughts he expressed about the scientific and theological ideas of Teilhard de Chardin and also this notion of the cosmic Christ. I, I do intend to explore that further. I think there's something very profound to, to be looked at there. And as a matter of fact, I happen to know, uh, because you and I are very good friends, that you have some distinct thoughts relating the Hebrew Kabbalah, the Jewish mysticism, to the notion of the cosmic Christ. Well, I'm not the only one. As a matter of fact, there is the Hebrew tree of life in Kabbalah. It's very important. And right at the center of it is what they call a sephirot, one of the facets of the Godhead, the Elohim. You see, really, the Hebrew God, although we say there's only one God, God has many facets, many aspects. And right at the heart is one known as Tiferet, which is the expression of love and beauty. Well, I think we're getting somewhere here. I think this is a very interesting conversation. I bet if I probed you further, we'd have a lot more to talk about. But I think this is a good point to end. It's, after all, just an initial experiment. So, uh, from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for being with me. Well, thank you for having me. This has been a unique experience, and it bodes well for the idea that New Thinking Aloud is going to keep exploring new frontiers. So I'm delighted to be with you. And for those of you 
watching or listening, thank you for being with us.